Hello and welcome to the Trauma Resilience Podcast. And today, before I tell you who I'm joined um, by, we do talk about some really quite challenging things on this podcast. There's no question about that. Um, but I think today we're probably going to touch on some stuff that could be really difficult. And if you're not sure about whether that's going to be difficult for you, so for example, one of the things I think we will speak about will be suicide. Just get somebody that you know to screen listen and just check that it's okay. And without any more delay, I'm going to say hello to Mike. Hello, Lisa. How are you? I'm really good. Now, Mike, I'm always loath to say your surname because <laughs> I know this must happen to you a lot. Cause Mike awesome. Armiger. Mike That's Armiger. Yes. Yeah, Mike you, Armiger. you got it in the first take. <laughs> However, I always tell a very funny story that I was at the doctor's once. Um, that's not the funny story. Um, but I was um, waiting <laughs> wait to see the doctor. And I was at a new doctor that I hadn't seen before. And um, the doctor came out and um, looked at his notes and went, Mr. 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 Michael A. Minger? Mr. Michael A. Minger. <laughs> so I, um, I, and this is terrible working for the NHS, but I, I actually didn't stand up and take my appointment that day. I sat there and laughed at everybody else. I'm not surprised. <laughs> Very well. Yeah, well, I'm really, really, I'm really, really happy. Mike, Ar now I can't say it again. <laughs> I can't Armager. You, you Armager. Have to, you have to Mike it. Armager, it's so, so good to have you on the podcast. And I'm so excited to have you here today. And, um, and I know I'm worried about how we're actually going to contain ourselves for 40 minutes. <laughs> There's so many crossovers and, and things that points of reference and places we've bumped into each other and all of that stuff. But I guess the best place to start really um, is just who, who is Mike and how did you arrive at a point in your life where you found yourself on Lisa Cherry's podcast? <laughs> so that's a question I've been contemplating all morning, Lisa. Um, who is Mike? Mike is um, somebody who tries to do lots of different things that I feel um, make a significant difference um, in the world of health and education, um, but also the things that normally that I've been touched by myself or that my family or people that I care for have to. I think the, the thing that really drives me is authenticity. Um, and I feel that when I'm not doing things that don't speak to me and um, I don't feel are important to the people that I really care for, I, I don't really feel authentic and I don't think that that's a comfortable place to be and I think there's many people who sadly have to do that you know day in day out and and I totally understand that but for me it's a real problem um especially when I feel that you're imparting things and knowledge to people and you know, all of those things so authenticity is is hopefully what I would I would hope other people would say is is Mike with any luck yeah fantastic and I don't see how you could be involved in this work and it not be something that is part of your own walk. You know, if we think about walking the walk, talking the talk, it's such a passion. And I, I feel exactly the same, you know, that that's what's really important to me and, and what spaces I engage in, who I engage with, where I align my, um, beliefs, thoughts, feelings, all of those things. So that's probably how we ended up having this conversation. But I did want to talk to you. I mean, I don't, I don't feel like I know you very well at all, even though we have passed, uh, our paths have crossed um, at different conferences. But I know that the two areas that I think I've seen your passion really shine through would be around mental health uh, and particularly um, suicide prevention. Do you want to just talk a little bit about how, what you do and what does that look like day to day and how do you get involved in, in, in doing that? How does that manifest? Sure. So, I mean, I'm very fortunate that I work in multiple different settings. I work within the NHS, within suicide prevention, within um, liaison psych services crisis teams, for instance. Um, and then I also work as, as an advisor to, um, to, to training um, organisations as well. So I do a lot of training with um, mental health professionals, but also across education. So my background is predominantly in education as a teacher um, and as head of provision for social, emotional and mental health needs. 
I am very fortunate that I get to stand both in the training room but also in practice and so I see patients on, on a weekly basis and work with students as well. Um, I think that one of the things that is very important to get across to people is that quite often we talk about suicide in particular and it's a very very difficult topic to bring up with people it's one of the most um, one of the most terrifying topics for people to talk about in terms of thinking about their own levels of capability their own thoughts but also family members and loved ones too and I think that stops us engaging on, on, on a level and, and I think that's problematic because what we tend to do is we tend to only talk about suicide with relation to illness and, and so much of my work is trying to explain to people that often what we're seeing is symptoms of distress not of illness and, and I for instance last week um, I, I think I think it was a total of 23 patients that I saw um, and out of those 23 patients that I, that I was working with all different demographics different ages different experiences I'd probably only say that one of those people probably had an acute need that needed supporting. Actually, a lot of things that had happened across those, uh, across those patients' experiences, clinical history, were a result of trauma, were a result of different adverse experiences that they'd had. And circumstances changing, you know, a lot of the things that, that we see quite regularly, people losing jobs, um, and being in significant amounts of debt. So I, I think one of the things that I'm very keen to, to push in terms of the conversation around this topic area is that you don't have to be ill to experience a suicidal thought. And if you don't have to be ill, then that means that we can't leave it to health professionals to just intervene and to have these conversations. We have to try and humanize this a little bit more. So one of the things that, that we talk about quite regularly within, within the training that I'm working is that we explain to people that if, if, if we think about it, there are times when many of us have sort of led there in bed when we wake up in the morning um, or gone to sleep thinking at night, actually, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if I didn't wake up in the morning. You know, lots of, lots of us have had those thoughts. Now, that's not necessarily, people don't think that that's a suicidal thought, but that's often where these things can manifest. The loss of hope. All of those things can actually contribute to the circumstance that people can find themselves in, and it can happen very quickly. It can happen over a period of months, years. You know, everybody's different. But one of the things that I think we are really not hitting on at the moment with regards to suicide prevention and thinking about how we intervene and mitigate is that actually the, um, the element of hope, which is really important within mitigating suicide, lies within both connection, lies within people's social circumstance, all of those things. A patient told me the other day that um, one of the things, and this isn't a, an isolated story, I hear this quite regularly, and you talk to anybody in the profession and they'll tell you the same thing, that many patients report that often it's a complete random stranger that's instilled um, a, a hopeful moment for them, a hopeful experience, um, often it's pets. Um, all of those things can really help us build hope within our own lives. So once we start to explore these things and we start to especially explore the, the element of people's thoughts being that some people don't actually want to die, some people just want a break from their life. That's a question that I ask in, in my assessments and other people asking in their assessments um, of patients. And, and often people have got a very specific idea. I once had a patient tell me that actually they just wanted to break for two weeks. I mean, that, you know, to start with, I was thinking, well, that, that's very specific, you know, and, and actually it's, it's quite bizarre when you hear people say those things out loud, but often it's quite logical and it makes sense. And mm -hmm. then the question becomes, well, actually in that two weeks, what would you see yourself doing in order to sort things out? So I, I think just having that human conversation and understanding the logic that lies behind many of these thoughts and many of this um, suicidal thinking that we see. And, and in relation to self-harm can really help us to, I think, um, desensitise the conversation a little bit at an earlier date. Yeah, and I, it's really interesting because that whole kind of suicidal thoughts um, area, and I think you're absolutely right, we don't speak about it. I mean, I've had suicidal thoughts mm. and I've spoken to enough people to know that that's not unusual but how many people have that conversation out loud? And, and I wonder if some of it's driven actually, because when, um, I remember when I first started working in, in services, so we're in the nineties, if somebody expressed a suicidal thought, you immediately had to report them, mm -hmm. you had to report them and make a referral because if you didn't and something happened, then, you know, then, then you would have a problem because you wouldn't have responded. And I think that has driven 
um, that need to not talk about it, that, that need to hide the fact that most people have that experience. Um, that is not something that's discussed. And I wonder where, whether that comes from that kind of fear of what if I haven't done something, what if I haven't dealt with this and something happens, mm. coupled with the layers of shame. And I think shame is something, and, and, and we have to thank, thank Brene really in lots of ways for this because she's made something incredibly difficult and painful to talk about, rather mainstream for those of us that work in these, in these areas. And I'm very grateful for that because there's layers of shame about about saying that you want to die, e even if having those thoughts are actually that desire to make it stop. Totally, totally. And one of the things that um, people get worried about asking people if they've had a suicidal thought, you know, for, for some of the reasons that you've outlined very, very well. Um, and, and what I often say to people is that I've asked that question so many times, um, you know, mainly because A, I'm trained to ask that question, but also because I see it day in day out. And, and I think people find it very difficult to ask because people worry about the adverse reactions that they might get back. But I have to say, bar maybe one or two, and I've asked, you know, this question hundreds and thousands of times, I, I very rarely have I had a, a really adverse response from somebody. Very rarely has somebody been really, really cross or upset with me that I've asked that question. And I've asked this on, you know, platforms in transport stations. I've asked this in multiple different places, you know, within my own house. And and often people feel a very sen a big sense of relief that mm. you've often asked the question because it allows people sometimes to say, well, actually, yes. Or, you know, I always say to people, actually, if you say no, and no, I haven't, then I'm really pleased about that. That's a, that's a really good thing. So it breaks the level of awkwardness. But it's really difficult to, to ask those questions. And, and one of the things which I think um, you referenced really well is, is the element of shame. And shame can be so suffocating that when you don't have the words to articulate your experience um, and articulate your pain and distress, then actually what you sometimes need is a narrative to cling on to. Now, I always say, you know, my bookshelves are absolutely full with a wide range of books all of whom, both fiction and non-fiction, speak to me on a certain level. And there are post-its all over these books. And the reason there's post-its all over these books is because in each book, different chapters, different words, different stories, I find a little bit of my narrative that I relate to. And so I've built all across that bookshelf, all different elements of my narrative that I feel describe both circumstances, myself, elements of personality, experiences, all those things. And people don't have a narrative to, to hang on to. So when we talk about, for instance, the, um, the mental health awareness weeks and all of those things, you know, people say, well, just talk, just talk, just talk. But people don't have the words. Mm -hmm. so, so some people don't have the ability to say, well, this is for sure what I'm feeling because I don't have the ability to think out loud with somebody. So I can't tell in my own thought, if, especially if I'm not rational, if this is true or if this isn't. I can't distinguish between you know, fantasy and reality. I can't do these things, which are some of the things that we work with every day but I think what we have to be very mindful of with people and one of the things that I try to do is to try and give people vocabulary shared language tools they don't have to take on and, and utilize but they can certainly use it as a springboard to other words so I give them multiple scenarios and multiple words that they can possibly identify with or allow them to build upon I think that's really crucial and it's so simple to do so simple which is why I, I'm a big fan of people with lived experiences um, sharing their stories and talking about actually, you know, the times where they've been there in those spots, the times where they've really experienced those things. Because it might not be somebody's complete story and narrative, but there might be a little part of that that allows somebody a little bit of relation, which means that they can then go on to articulate their own pain and distress. So I think that the shame element is really important because, of course, what we can't do is, you know, me in, in my role within services and, and other professionals and people as well, we can't do much unless there is that level of articulation. So, so you know, actually there has to be a big piece of work done beforehand um, within community settings, within schools, all of those things for people to have the language and tools for which to articulate their thoughts and pain. Mm. And I wonder where do we develop that language? You know, I mean, from, from my own journey, I felt very fortunate, really, because I 
my recovery journey started at 20 um, in, a, in an AA meeting, you know, which led me to John Bradshaw's toxic shame. And I, I can't do his American accent, but if you heard him <laughs> deeply, deeply, because I used to listen to him on a Walkman um, mm. on cassette. That's how long ago that was. Um, and people like Louise Hay and Alice Miller, the drama of being a child, you know, just all these amazing books that, that started to open up an opportunity for having a narrative about my distress, which made everything so much easier. Didn't help me be open at work, didn't help me uh, deal with the primal wound, but certainly enabled that um, ability to find other like-minded people because that's what narrative does. Narrative opens up relationships and that was very, very healing. So I think in lots of ways, my journey is quite unique. Most people can have got a higher pain threshold than I had uh, and will take their misery into, well, much, much further into their life. But I just, I just couldn't really take any more of, of myself. So I'm very grateful for that. Mm. Um, you know, if, you know, where do we, where are the spaces really for, developing that narrative for opening up those conversations that help you find other people who may be slightly further down the road than you so can mentor you in some way definitely and I, I think this is about you know I'm a big fan of the work that schools do being an educator but I, I also think we put a lot of responsibility on schools too um, you know we often ask them to fix all of society's problems um, and so I think it starts with an education and, and emotional literacy and all of those things but I do also think that we have to equip absolutely everybody that comes into contact with people um, to make people more emotionally intelligent. And, and I don't mean that you plant intelligence levels within people by sending them on a two day course and all of a sudden you're rendered intelligent in this area, but that you have some simple vocab to use. One of the keywords that I use is overwhelmed. Mm. And, and I use this within students and um, whether it be um, in, in schools, whether it's in university, the amount of university students that speak to me about their distress and talk to me about the, the problems that they're experiencing and the thoughts that they're experiencing. And then I say to them, you know, do you feel overwhelmed? And they go, yes, that's exactly how I'm feeling. Exactly that. But I feel overwhelmed with my work. I feel overwhelmed with life. I feel overwhelmed with this. And, you know, actually, it, it's such a simple word, but it has multiple connotations. Now, I'm not a fan of asking people to articulate things perfectly. It's never going to happen. But I think that certainly if we have go-to words, that we can put in front of people that are humanizing and not pathologizing then all of a sudden we can introduce some elements of logic you know i i met somebody the other week who'd um and, and you know, they i spoke to them about their story and, and they do fantastically well now and i'm very very pleased that they that, that they, they're really recovering well but they had faced just adverse circumstances beyond belief and and they were in such a difficult place and, and they'd lost um, three members of their family, two parents and a, and a sibling within the space of within the space of three or four weeks. And and and, and they said, yeah, I just I just feel like I don't know what's going on. And, and I just I just feel like I can't cope. And I said to them, but I, if, if one of those things had happened to me, I would feel exactly the same as you. But you've had three. That, that, that's that's a huge amount of, of distress and pain, you know, for, for one person to carry. So I, I'm not saying that that makes it any easier, but you know, this logic, but it does totally make sense what you're feeling. Mm. And, and I think that one of the, one of the things that we do in psychiatry, which is a biggest problem is that we tell people that the problem lies inherently within them. Yes. I, I do a lot of talking around borderline personality disorder. You know, for example, I think it's barbaric that we tell people that it's somebody's personality which is disordered when there's actually zero evidence that exists that this is the case. You know, they called it emotionally unstable disorder recently, which in my view is not that much better. Um, but one of the things that I think we have to really look at is that that diagnosis depends purely upon two main diagnostic criteria of inability to uh, tolerate intense emotions and uh, fear of abandonment. Well, that pretty much describes the majority of people that I see week in, week out. Um, and, and people who aren't necessarily in, in huge amounts of distress that also have those also have those problems. People tolerate intense emotions and distress levels very differently. And they tolerate them very differently according to you know, where they are in their life. You, you mentioned, you, you just referenced that, you know, actually you felt that you didn't take a lot at that particular time maybe to feel overwhelmed. 
but I'd imagine that that's completely different now and that there are different weeks, months, days, all of those things where, where that changes. It's completely contextual. But I think to tell somebody that they're disordered and their personality is disordered in some way because they feel those things, I, I just I can't get my head around mm. how that works. And of course, you know from, from the work that you do, I, I come into contact with so many care leavers who have a diagnosis of BPD um, because of elements of abandonment within their own life, which when you go back to their history, it makes total sense that they would fear that. Um, and, and, and also um, the element of tolerating intense emotions, well, that's often linked to not having resources and support around you mm. or not being able to articulate those things. So it's so contextual that to slap a BPD diagnosis on somebody um, and then, you know, I think there's this element within services and I see it and I wish I didn't, but I do see it where there's this attitudes towards people that are frequent service users that go, Oh, you know, they're on the phone again and we've got to go and attend again and we've got to do this again. And, and it just perpetuates the stigma and, and, and the shame that you referenced earlier of, I have the problem. I have BPD. It's all of the problems that lie within me rather than my circumstance and what's happened. And these labels are just very so much located in power. They're located in power. And, you know, that the fear of abandonment stuff, difficulty overwhelming, dealing with overwhelming emotion. These are part of the human experience. And until we can make those connections with each other, then we're going to continue to say that there is a normal upon which we all circulate and that we're trying to and this is what feeds shame it's almost like society has this need for people to sit in shame because it's so immobilizing it's so destabilizing and silencing that it means that we can do whatever we want to then you know that's that to me is the context um for such a bizarre uh terminology as um personality disorder you know so, so with things like um just moving on then to thinking about mental health awareness weeks and things like that i mean they evoke lots and lots of reactions in people one of them being we know so we have the awareness can we do the next thing um another one being um it's it can be quite lightweight you know in in terms of what is it actually shifting and changing? So thinking about the conversation we've just had really about how we open up emotional intelligence, how we develop a language for people um, to support the way that we can communicate with each other about our distress, which would help eliminate a whole range of things like shame. Does, does Mental Health Awareness Week, do you think, go enough of a way to doing that? What could it look like what should it look like and what does it look like? It's a very important question. And I think that we've got it totally wrong so far. Um, and I think we've got it totally wrong because what we do, and, and I've, I've been in charge of this, I, and I don't say this because I'm uniquely virtuous. I say this because I've got it wrong previously. And I've been in charge of organising mental health awareness weeks within my provisions previously within education and, and, and now, you know, advising many other places. But, one of the things that I think we still do, again, it's going back to that pathology. For instance, you know, the one in four figure, which is pointed out, you know, all the time, one in four of us will suffer with a mental health related issue at some point. Well, the, the problem with the terminology that we use is that if you talk about a mental health related issue, well, that term in itself can mean so many different things that it's almost saying to people, well, one in four of us have got mental health, <laughs> which is a completely bizarre thing to state. I don't think we really understand what, um, what mental health is. You know, the World Health Organization points towards it being a state of being, um, a state of well-being that we are experiencing day in, day out. And, and mental health is very different to mental ill health. And distress is part of that, stress is part of that, wellness, all of those things. So we know that it exists on a continuum. But what, one of the things that I would, just, I would just point towards is that I have a massive, massive problem with, with posters. And I know this sounds bizarre, you know, I don't mean, you know, I hate all posters, I mean with relation to mental health. Um, I, I was in a school the other week, with, and this is so well-intentioned, this is not, you know, and I said this to them, it doesn't come from a place of um, inflicting this on people and wanting to do things right, it comes from a very good intended place. But I was in a school recently and they had this, um, they had this poster about depression. 
Um, and this poster, again, wasn't designed by themselves, it wasn't the words that they used, but this, this poster talked about this element of darkness existing within people um, and this, um, this whole persona that people can assume. And, 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 I, and I just said to them, I, I think what we have to be very careful of is that we don't give this narrative to people that it is a lifelong illness that people are going to be burdened with for the whole of their entire lives. Now, there are people who will suffer with low mood and depression related elements for, for, for much of their life. We totally get that. But, you know, when we go back to things like the chemical imbalance myth and that people believe that naturally their brain is naturally imbalanced because that's a myth that has been perpetuated for years. Um, and, and we still have people in the health profession that are still using that. People then straight away when they get to Mental Health Awareness Week, when we talk about narrative, will look at that depression poster, see one bullet point on that poster and say, that's me. And, and that's me. So I now have lifelong depression. So they don't, if we talk about it being low mood, then, then that's a totally different implication, isn't it? Because it gives the idea that it's maybe a little bit more temporary and that it's not permanent and that things can shift and that there are, there are elements that are contextual within it. So I think even to start with, the way that we pitch Mental Health Awareness Week is, is, very, is very difficult. And I also think that we always pitch, well, here's the problems. We don't talk about how to stay well. And, and I think that's one of the things that, you know, within your work and within lots of other people I see working in this field, that actually we really need to push forward is that actually, if, if we're going to prevent more people from falling into the river, we have to resource them earlier and further upstream with the tools that they need to stay well. And that means, sadly, and I know governments don't like saying this, but that means investment. <laughs> and that means people, that means resources, all of those things. So Mental Health Awareness Week is a very loaded week for me. And I often, there are people that do this brilliantly. And really contextual and really get it but I think if we just change the, the language and the words right from the top and, and informed people on a better level then I think that they would willingly spread that message. It's really interesting you talk about that kind of well-meaning stuff because I, I was um, speaking to an abs a lovely group of head teachers across a local authority and two schools came in and I, I was talking to them about resilience which is one of my favorite subjects um, and two classes came in from different schools they were brought in and they did a demonstration of what they'd been learning about resilience and how resilient they were and they did little videos and it was so it was so lovely but I, I felt so sad and, and after they'd gone I kind of said and this had been funded by um, Public Health England so it was a very big collaborative piece of work that they put so much work into and I felt mm. really awful kind of commenting on it but I just I just there was no way I was going to be able to do my presentation next uh, and have the conversation without showing what it looked like to me had happened and of course what had happened is the whole resilience discussion in in both the schools really had been individualized for those children so if those children then went on to their secondary school and, their, and they were struggling in their secondary school, I have no doubt in my mind that the way that they un had understood resilience would mean that they would think there was something wrong with them. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and I, was just, I just felt so sad, really, because this really well-meaning, um, well-funded, well-resourced, compassionate, caring adults all around with these lovely primary school children unfortunately had fed the message that it's not about all the things that it's about which is your environment your resources your relationships all of those things it's about you and how many times you can stand back up again and um and i felt i felt very sad and i guess that's the thing isn't it you know we've got some really key important uh, key messages that are really feeding in across all the sectors um, but we have to be so careful about how we actually do those things how we actually talk about them how we deliver speaking about them and how we ensure that people understand the connection element uh, of it. I don't want to lose the individual because we're all so unique and bring what we bring to the party. But at the same time, if we continue along this individualization of humans, 
then we're not going to get past the stuff that we started talking about, which is about language, which is about connection, which is about narrative and which is about emotional intelligence. I totally agree. And, and, I, and I, think, I think you articulated it very well that we, we don't want to remove the individual element from this but we have to give people working definitions as well. Now, there is always going to be an exception to that, and we have to be very clear on that. But I think when I talk about resilience, for example, I always say to people, if I had somebody walk in who was experiencing suicidal thought, for example, or was even experiencing you know, chronic stress, all of those things, would, would it be appropriate if they lived in temporary accommodation, had no access to food um, and no money for me to talk to them about resilience? I mean, people would think that was totally ridiculous. Yet with children, we, we often do that. We often talk to them about the need to be resilient when, when what they're doing is surviving. And, and I, I think we have to be very careful about that, um, about pushing the, the resilience message. And, and it's, it's a very big word and a very loaded term, as, as you said quite rightly, Lisa. But one thing I would just say to people is that the, the, the key phrase I always use is, you know, resilience is more about we than it is about me. It, resilience is, is not the same as surviving. And what we see is many people surviving their circumstance mm -hmm. and telling people to be resilient, I think sometimes inadvertently without intention actually gives people the message that if we tell them to be resilient in those times, that what they're experiencing is okay and that they should be able to survive those things. When if you've got people living in such adverse and dire circumstances, that's totally the wrong message to be giving them. Mm -hmm. you know, so so I, I think you're absolutely right. And that carries over into again, um, you know, talking about all of these problems lying within people. And, and I don't know about you, but there are certainly, because I'm very fortunate and I've sat both sides of the table, you know, both of somebody trying to help somebody, but also, you know, the person needing help. And one of the things that I always talk about is that it took me probably seven or eight different types of therapeutic work before I found one that really worked for me. And, and I was able to have the autonomy and the decision making um, uh, and rational thought and all of those things to inform what I thought was the right thing for me. But for many people, they don't have that. And so actually, when we send people into treatment, for example, we prescribe what we think is the best possible thing. And, you know, provision is another thing altogether and it's dire. Um, but we prescribe the best possible thing that we think, but we don't allow people to dip their toe in and try it. Mm -hmm. We don't give people a wide range of therapeutic options that is going to work for them. And we also don't appreciate that that probably is going to change. And that there's a whole range of things that you need to do before somebody even starts therapeutic work. With my students, when they, when they go to a GP or primary care, um, or they go in for an appointment, and they need to talk about a difficult subject, one of the things I always do with them is I sit them down, um, and you know I, I might refer them sometimes, but if they go in themselves, because they're adults, one of the things that I do is I, I, we write down a thing um, a, on a piece of paper in the book, whatever they want to on their phone, a load of notes so that they can take with them and so that they can say, right, the, if, if I climb up in the appointment and if I can't get the words out, which we know happens for so many people, then, then I've got something I can even just simply hand over to them. You know, I mean, e even just preparing somebody for that circumstances and saying this is going to be particularly difficult, maybe not to worry you, not to not to scare you. But there is a possibility. Let's prepare for that and let's mitigate against that now whilst I'm in the room with you and I can give you those words and help you. I mean, that's just, it's just a sensible thing to do. You don't have to be a clinician to do that, do you? So I, I think just that that element of mitigating against all of these circumstances can really help people. And having, you know, non-medical interventions i mean you know you talked there about having autonomy i mean and, and and that's what i had as well and i and i feel really fortunate because mo most of my recovery was done on all what are classed as alternative mm -hmm. holistic therapies which are very thorough uh you spend a good 45 minutes before your first session mm -hmm. talking about who you are your childhood, your birth, if you know it, you know, all the things that impact you, which we don't do in a medical setting, that is done. Um, and yet, I mean, there are areas who've been prescribing things like going walking and stuff like that, which is fantastic. You know, there's, there's so many informal interventions that support better and stronger mental health. And yet we still think of them as alternative. Um, when actually, why can't, why can't we look at those as imperative, not alternative, but 
so that you have a, like you say, a, a, a platter of options to try until you find that thing. Cause you will, you will find that thing. And that thing might change. You might do that thing for six weeks and then think, actually, I want to, I need to go deeper or that's not quite getting to that part of what's bothering me or, and then to be able to move around and do that. We, we don't, we're, 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 we are a million miles away from that. A million miles away from that. Totally. And, and I think I, I, I run a project um, with, um, with athletes and um, professional athletes with mental health support. And one of the things that I'm always struck by is that the things that they find therapeutic are their sports themselves normally. But when it becomes a profession, and when it becomes your job, then it's a totally different thing. There are moments where they still obviously find it very therapeutic, but actually the therapeutic elements lie outside of what they do. And, and if we think about it, you know, one of the things that, um, that athletes report to me all the time is that when you become a persona and when you are your job, um, you know, and, and there's elements of people, you know, who are self-employed, you know, who understand this as well, that actually that can really distort sometimes your sense of who you are. Um, and also sometimes distort um, the the difference between you and, and 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 the athlete, and the separation between you as a person and you as an athlete is something that they really struggle with because naturally the two cross over multiple times a day. But one of the things that they find therapeutic often is going and talking to somebody who does a not know who they are, um, which which again you know actually a lot of people spend ages saying well actually I just want somebody that really knows me well, whereas actually people in the public eye often say actually do you know what? I want somebody that doesn't know me and doesn't. Know Know anything about me I want that clean slate all of those things so again it works really differently according to the circumstance that you're in but their therapeutic work a lot of the time is not talking about anything related to performance their job anything a lot of times talking about pressure the amount of pressure that they hold I mean I, I worked in professional sport for a while within um, within rugby and I I would always if there was a big event or a big game coming up I would normally give where I could people a week off or a day off or something, because I, I had to be very mindful of how the pressure built on each individual. And when you carry that pressure around for so much time, I mean, that's a lot of tension to hold. Even though these are, you know, these are sports people, you know, they go out and they perform and there's an element of physicality. So I, I think we, we have to think very similarly with regards to people in mental health services, people in schools, that actually what we consider therapeutic doesn't need to be the standard models of treatment which involve talking therapies. I, I, you, you say this as much as I do, that actually there are very few children that have experienced traumatic circumstances and that hold trauma in their bodies that are able to articulate that and that are able to articulate, recollect, and you know everything we know around implicit memory. So actually, just from that basis, by purely prescribing talking therapies, we are missing out probably on three quarters of people that have experienced trauma. So that, that makes no sense from a commissioning point of view. And I think we're starting to understand this, but my hope is now that over the next couple of years that we're going to really start to delve into this a little more. One of the things we just started at university with, with medical students, we started a walking group um, and that they just go regularly walking um, and they go various different places, stop and have a coffee. They check in with each other. They have a bit of a chat and it's that sense of community. It costs no money whatsoever. They don't have to go every week. They can access it when and when they want to and they can talk about whatever they want to. Mm. And, and, and it's so simple. It, we, we create these barriers for, for reasons sometimes out of our own thinking rather than what the needs and the requirements are because it's always been done that way. Yeah, and they're learning as well what you need to be well. So Absolutely. they're doing it and they're learning it. And so that process of learning what the body needs to be to relieve stress, to be well, to you know alter the physiology change what's going on in your mind they're learning all of those things as well but i mean as i suspected we we could talk all day and i kind of <laughs> knew this was going to happen um so as we kind of come into a close i suppose i'm quite interested in what you're doing currently and what work you've got going on and what's what's your what's the big mic project of the moment so there's there's multiple things that, that I'm that I'm doing. I'm doing a lot more around athlete support. I'm doing a lot more with with suicide prevention. We've just launched um, a wonderful website called um, stayingsafe.net, 
which is around safety planning. So members of the public can access that if you're concerned about somebody um, or you yourself might need to, to write a safety plan. There's an interactive tool which you can do online and then download it as a PDF version, um, which, which we're immensely proud of, which, which we've done in line with NHS England. Um, so that's been fantastic. There's a lot more work um, around education coming up next year. Um, and then I'm doing a lot around um, elements of regulation. So I'm working with CAMS teams in terms of what we just talked about, trying to get people to access therapeutic ways of working which involve regulation rather than talking um, and trying to do that preemptive piece of work that hopefully if we do it right, can get people calm, safe and regulated before they then go into talking therapy. Or if, it, uh, and again, if at all that's, that's appropriate. So. Lots of um, small system changes, Lisa. <laughs> you know, I, I, like to, I like to take the little things on rather than the, um, the, the big thing. You know, I like to do little things that nobody, nobody needs. Um, so I, I think, you know, what, what I really love about um, conversations like this is that sometimes when we work in isolation um, and, you know, especially being self-employed and all those things, um, it can feel like sometimes you're battling things by yourself. Um, but what I'm always aware of, you know, from, from yourself and from other people within the community is that actually very rarely are we by ourselves and that we do, we do have a lot of people and a lot of things in common um, and a lot of people willing us on. Um, so I, I'm really grateful for this conversation today. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Mike. And I totally know what you mean. I, it, you know, it's, I think of us as like teamies. We're all <laughs> just teamies wandering around the country, you know, trying to do our bit. But what I'm really excited about and what you've really left me with is that kind of vision and hope for what we can really focus on for the next couple of years, which is really consolidating a lot of the knowledge that we've been delivering and a lot of the stuff we've been learning and starting to think about um, not medicalizing very normal human responses to what can sometimes be very distressing experiences that are part of living definitely yeah so thank you so much mike you've been awesome i knew you would be <laughs> my pleasure thank you so much take care lisa all the best take care see you soon bye, bye.